You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 44. Well, welcome to the Little Green Cheese podcast. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Now, I have a question. I'll just uh, play that straight away because this is the main topic of the show today. Hello, Mr. Galvin. My name's Timothy Lopez from Michigan. I was wondering, what types of cheeses can I wax? Well, thanks very much for the question, Timothy. Well, I tend to wax my... Well, semi-hard and hard cheeses, um, and that's mainly because, and I probably mentioned it before in many, many episodes, that because of the quantity of milk that I use, I only use usually between 8 and 14 litres of milk, which I usually then get a yield, a cheese yield of about a kilogram or what's that, 2.2 pounds uh, of cheese if I'm using 8 and if I'm using 14 litres of milk. It's probably about uh, 1.5 kilos or three, yeah, three pounds of cheese. So those smaller quantities of cheese tend to dry out a lot quicker when you're maturing it. So I tend to wax those cheeses uh, all vacuum packed. Depends um, on on how I'm feeling that day, um, but uh, yeah, I I tend to wax those cheeses. So cheeses like. Uh, farmhouse cheddar, Colby, any other sorts of cheddar. So normal cheddar using the cheddaring process. I I wax Wensleydale, uh, also wax uh, my Parmesan and I wax my Romano because they tend to dry out really quickly because they have really long maturation periods of uh, one year and 10 months respectively. So they're the sorts of cheeses I I wax. So how I do that is a different topic, but uh, we'll mention that here. I use a a wax bowl. So I have a, I've got a stainless steel bowl that I sit on top of just a normal uh, saucepan. And in the saucepan, in the saucepan, I've got about five centimetres of water, which is what, two inches So I have that in there and I get that to the boil and then I put my stainless steel wax pot on top. So it's fairly deep. It's deep enough to dip half a a wheel of cheese into. So you can, you're holding the top half and then then, uh, dip the the cheese in and then pull that out, let that that harden and then dip in the other half and do that two or three times and you've totally coated your, uh, your cheese. Now I've made a what I think are quite excellent uh, video tutorial on how to wax cheese. Uh, And I'll slip that into uh, the show notes and you can see me in that video waxing uh, two farmhouse cheddars with peppercorn. Um, It's uh, quite an amazing cheese. So, yeah, to answer your question, Timothy, they're the sorts of cheeses I wax and it's more... Uh, for keeping the moisture in the cheese to stop them from drying out uh, prematurely more than uh, protecting them from bacteria. But uh, it certainly helps if you have uh, those cheeses waxed because if your cheese fridge or cheese cave doesn't have a high enough humidity, if you were trying to rind, uh, sorry, if you were trying to make a natural rind, then waxing is a, is a pretty good alternative. Uh, all of the cheeses that I've waxed have turned out okay, if not fantastic. So it's a very good way of, of uh, preserving your cheese during the maturation period. So give waxing a go. It's nice and easy. As I said, I'll pop the waxing video into the, into the show notes. Well, today's news comes from Russia, of all places. Now, they've got a... the Sorry, I'll start again. The Today's news comes from Russia, and it's, uh, well, quite funny, but if you live in Russia, it's not very funny because you're not getting the cheese you're after. 
this is a news piece from um, Channel News Asia, and the headline is uh, Russian police smash illegal US 30 million cheesemaking ring. Russian officials have started bulldozing piles of cheese, peaches and even frozen geese after President Vladimir Putin ordered the destruction of the smuggled food. You see, Russia's got a bit of an embargo on Western um, food products or ingredients and uh, due to the opposing embargo on um, stuff, uh, uh, sanctions um, to Russia over the invasion of the Crimea, if I remember rightly. Anyway, a bit of a tater tape. But um, what the new news things goes on to say that says that uh, police in the Moscow region have arrested six people for producing cheese worth some 30 million US, 27 million euros. I think that's about 41 million dollars Australian because they were using a banned Western rennet, a substance that contains enzymes used for cheese production. The authorities foiled the activities of an organised international criminal gang in Moscow region where members have for a long time been engaged in smuggling sanctioned products from abroad. Police spokesman Yelena Alexkiva said in a statement, the cheese that they've been making. So uh, law enforcement officers recovered some 470 kilograms which is a 1,000 pounds of rennet and equipment to print counterfeit labels um, from using separate, 17 separate searches of suspects' homes, offices and warehouse, the Interior Ministry said. And they can face 10 years in prison for importing the rennet. Uh, I find this uh, quite, uh, quite astounding that uh, cheese is now a criminal activity. Um, but, uh, you know, anything to get cheese on the table uh, for for, uh, for the Russians who are having to not get the cheese that they're used to from, um, from Western European countries. So that's the news. Bit of a lighter take on the news, uh, but not so light for the, uh, the people in Russia who uh, aren't getting the cheese that they're used to. So we have quite a few uh, questions today, so we'll get stuck into those. Uh, this one's from John, and John's from Augusta, Maine in the US. He says, I like the idea of vac packing to preserve moisture. Since I won't be doing this as a regular thing, I don't want to spend a lot. Do you have any suggestions for a purchase? Do the hand pump systems work at all? Uh, John, the only experience I have, I bought a... Uh, I bought a vacuum packing system. It's used to preserve all sorts of food, uh, not only cheese, but uh, it was a pretty, I think it cost me, I think it was about $80 Australian. I'm not sure. I think it's about $60 US. And it came with uh, two rolls of the uh, uh, the plastic that's used to, to vac pack. It's, I think it's a Food Saver brand. I'm not sure. That may just be available in Australia. I'm not sure. There are lots of vacuum packing equipment. You don't have to buy the most expensive one. They seem to work. The electric ones work better than the hand pump ones, uh, of course, because uh, they have uh, continuous pump action sucking all the air out of the, the packaging. I haven't had any trouble with the seals that this uh, the Food Saver brand produces, so it's nice and easy. It uh, creates a good seal after it's sucked all the air out. And... It does indeed keep the moisture in uh, in the cheese and helps it pre- preserve. It's very similar to waxing a cheese, except you're using plastic instead. Just a little bit of a modern twist on cheese making. I still do, I wax 50-50, so I'll wax um, half the cheese. I find that Colby develops a lot better if it's waxed than vacuum-packed, but then I find that uh, Romano develops a better flavour if it's vacuum-packed than if you... If you wax it, and there's the odd chance that the the wax may um, breach, you may have a breach in the seal for the wax, and you may get bacteria in, because uh, cheeses like Romano have a very long maturation period, you know, between ten months and two years. Um, I've I've matured my um, latest Romano. Uh, it was about eighteen months. 
uh, and that was vac packed for the whole time. And the cheese was just amazing. The flavour was fantastic. It didn't have a rind like uh, you would have in a normal Romano, but it was certainly uh, dry enough in the cheese that it grated well. You could shave the cheese. You could actually slice. You could slice it and get a nice slice of Romano, even though it was a little bit crumbly. But yeah, definitely uh, for the longer maturing cheeses, you could uh, vac pack and and avoid any troubles with uh, moulds growing underneath uh, your cheese. So give it a go, John. And uh, if you can find something that's you know sub one hundred dollars, then I'd pick it up because most of them work quite well and they've got a one year warranty. So you shouldn't have too much troubles there. Hope that's answered your question and happy cheese making. Uh, the next one is from Emmy. Sorry if I muck up this pronunciations. Emmy Arno, spelled E M I L I A N O. Sorry if I haven't quite pronounced that right. It says, "Hi Gavin, I've noticed your hoop in the Blue Cheese Rescue looks like it's possibly a PVC pipe." Is that what it is? Do you often use these types of moulds? Well, an open-end mould is actually a hoop. So, yes, you described it right the first. And, yes, it is a PVC pipe, but it's a specific type of PVC pipe. And it's the type for using uh, rainwater. So uh, there are two types. There's one type of PVC pipe that actually has lead in it. So avoid that at all, all costs. That's the thicker type of pipe. But if you find PVC pipe that's used for rainwater harvesting, it doesn't have any lead uh, in the PVC, so it's safe enough to use as a cheese hoop. All I did is I cut the pipe by hand and I gave it a, a bit of a sand around the places where I cut it, so it smoothed it off. And yeah, it is, and then I put some slots in it, so you get a little bit of... Uh, of the way that comes out of those slots, but very simple to make. And uh, it, it's quite an easy cheese hoop to to use. I, look, I do prefer, if I can get them, cheese hoops made out of um, high-density polyethylene, which is food safe. You don't have any problems with that. But um, during that cheese rescue, I was a bit flustered, so I did end up grabbing the first thing that looked like uh, it would hold all of the curds um, I was trying to make a petite blue. Uh, that didn't quite end up. I didn't dry them in the smaller hoops long enough. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I had to resort to that PVC pipe one. So, I would, look, I wouldn't recommend PVC pipes because uh, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between sewage PVC piping and uh, rainwater harvesting PVC piping. The sewage one tends to have lead in it to strengthen it um, for earth movement. So... Yeah, try and uh, try and get your hoops and 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 cheese making molds or baskets made from um, high density polyethylene or plastic number two. Thanks very much for your question, and uh, I'm terribly sorry if I haven't pronounced your name properly. So on to the next one. This one's from Shirley, and Shirley says, "Hi Gavin, I really enjoy your blog and have found it really helpful. I am about to take the leap and move on from camembert and feta." to try to make a cheddar. It would seem to me from your photos that your earlier post showed cheeses maturing with a wax coating, but in the latter post they have been vacuum packed. Or do you just use vacuum sealing once the cheeses have reached the desired maturity? Regards Shirley, and Shirley's from New Zealand. You kind of answered the question in the in the previous answer, but to move on, yeah, what I do, like I said, I... 50-50 cheese, and it depends on the type of cheese, and I've found over time that uh, some some cheeses have a better taste when they're vacuum-packed and some have a better taste when they're waxed. But yes, I do. When the cheese is fully matured, I remove the wax coating uh, from any that I have waxed, and I do vacuum-pack them. So I cut them into half, uh, so I, I halve the wheel, and sometimes I even quarter it. depends on the type of cheese that it is. It is if it's a, a a hard Italian cheese that you only use a little of, then I'll quarter it and vacuum vacuum pack each quarter, uh, and use one unwrapped um, and wrap that in um, baking paper or grease proof grease proof paper, and uh, and store that in the cheese compartment of the fridge. 
of a normal kitchen fridge, um, but all the rest I vacuum pack until I need them. Uh, that way it uh, not only slows down maturation because the your normal refrigerator is at 4 degrees Celsius, uh, it keeps any moulds and bact- unwanted bacteria out of it. It's just like any other commercially produced cheese that you'll buy in the shop uh, that is... Uh, vacuum packed as well most of them are vacuum packed these days so I, I do use vacuum packing after the cheese has been matured so I hope that answers your question Shirley and thanks for writing in okay the next question is from Sophie uh, it's a bit of a long one so I'll, I'll uh, truncate it a little bit uh, it says hi Gavin I came across your cheese making site and absolutely love it Well, thanks very much Sophie uh, I found myself mesmerised at the cheese making processes you show on some of your videos you are truly a professional and inspirational I'm now blushing <laughs> that's also the reason I'm contacting you hoping you can help me out uh, I'm trying to make halloumi cheese and tried a couple of times and failed I'm just not getting to the point of curds um, I realised I'm using homogenised milk due to where we are located right now, Alaska. So far from the rest of the world, we can't get fresh milk and only have this store-bought milk. Um, it's either ultra-pasteurised or homogenised. Uh, she's tried just about everything. So look, to cut a long story short, what I think is happening here is that even if the cheese, uh, sorry, even if the milk is labelled as homogenised, I reckon it's been ultra pasteurized because if you don't have cows up there uh, and you can't get fresh milk then to ship it to alaska from what canada or mainland usa then the only way they're going to get it up there those sorts of distances is ultra pasteurized if you can't get past the curd uh, making process part of that process then it definitely is something to do with the milk uh, i don't think it's anything to do with um, what you're trying to do with halloumi but uh I think it would be the same for just about any cheese. So you're going to have to find other milk. I know it may be hard where you are, um, but there must be a dairy somewhere close by that you could approach the farmer and and try and get some milk fresh from the farm gate. That would be the only way you will be able to set a curd um, in, in the sort of cheese that you're making there, or any cheese. So... Look, it is possible to make it out of homogenised cheese, but it sounds like they have superheated the milk to prolong its life on the shelf. So unfortunately, Sophie, that seems to be what the case is. It's nothing you're doing. It's it's just the milk that you're using. So if you can source a fresher sort of milk, then uh, yeah, try and do that. Um, Otherwise, you're not going to have much luck making um, halloumi or anything like that. You would probably be able to make... Um, you'll be able to make ricotta, ricotta salada, certainly yogurt, no problems at all using that type of milk. But uh, yeah, you'll have a, a hard time trying to get a curd to set in any um, semi-hard or, or hard cheeses. So yeah, so unfortunately that's um, that's what you're going to have to do. So I hope that answers your question and thanks very much for sending it in. So the next question is from Mike and Mike says, thanks for your videos. I really like them. Could you please tell me the size and type of mould that you use in your video farmhouse cheddar with peppercorns? Thanks, Mike. I'm not sure where Mike's from, but yeah, the size mould that I use in that farmhouse cheddar with peppercorns is a a high-density polyethylene mould and it's 145 Um, millimeters across the top so the diameter and it's about the same height and it holds about a kilo of curd so which equates to using eight liters of milk so if you lose use a little bit less milk then you don't have so much trouble but it definitely um, it has a follower as well uh, which is also made of plastic which needs to um it assists in getting a flat surface when you're pressing it. So as I mentioned, it's 145 millimetres um, and it's one of the many cheese making baskets or moulds that uh, I have available over on our online store that we ship to Australian and New Zealand customers. You can find those over at uh, littlegreenworkshops.com.au 
and pop into the cheese making section and you'll see that cheese baskets and hoops and all that sort of good gear on the site there. So hopefully that's answered your question, Mike. Okay, we'll have uh, one last question. And this one's from Murray. And we've had questions from Murray before. Um, Murray sent me a picture. He's made a, a Manchego um, based on, I think, my cheese making video. It says the cheese does not have an unpleasant or odd smell. And, but the texture is not what we expected. And after reading warnings about cheese that looked like a loofah, we are wondering if it was safe to eat. We had a cheese making blitz before the end of the dairy season and the lovely farmer we purchased our milk for sold the farm and they made a bunch of cheeses, three of which we cut yesterday. They are much more holier than anything we've made previously. One was Manchego, one was a cumin gouda, uh, which was still very soft and inspired by your blue peppercorn cheese. We made a blue walnut cheddar. We could not help ourselves and sampled a little bit of the blue walnut, which is rich, creamy and fantastic. Big again, much softer and holier than it should be. Now, the smell is what you would expect from a blue cheese. After much reading and web searching, we we're wondering whether the problem with all these cheeses was old culture, something new we learned that you throw cultures out at the end of each season and start again. Do you think it is an old starter culture rather than contamination of the milk? and that the cheeses are safe to eat, but not quite correct look and feel. Another point that Christine made, some camembert at the same time, and after getting extremely professional results previously, the last camembert was a failure, and we used it for pizza topping, as it wasn't much good for anything else. The cumin gouda, gouda never firmed up after pressing, and once out of the mould, simply got wider and thinner while drying before waxing. All of these cheeses appear to be not quite right. Dud culture question mark many thanks murray well i've given it a bit of thought murray and as you mentioned look there could be two there is two possibilities one is the milk that the milk wasn't quite right and uh, could have been infected and in that case it probably wouldn't smell very right after ripening so you probably are okay murray sent in a photo so i'm going to put the photo into this posts into this uh, the show notes for this podcast uh, and you can see there are it looks like mechanical holes. Uh, it looks like well, one of the one of the things I first thought when I saw the photograph was that it hadn't been pressed hard enough, uh, and there were mechanical holes within the cheese. So they don't look like they've been made by a bloom of uh, a bacteria or something like that, like a propionic shimani or anything like that. It, they do look mechanical, and it's it's very strange. So you you can see the photo on the. On the the show notes, look, yeah, cultures do tend to expire after a couple of years if you kept them in the freezer. So try a new starter culture. Um, you've probably done that by now because you've sent the email through uh, last month. So, uh, yeah, new cultures will make a difference. Uh, make sure they're in date, especially when you get the same result for all three cheeses. It probably actually helped the blue cheese because... It would have had pockets of air for the blue cheese mould to develop, so that one will be fine. If they don't smell, then I think they're fine to eat. And you use your nose as a pretty good indication for cheese making. If it doesn't smell quite right, don't eat it. <laughs> then, um, But you probably consumed them by now, so there's probably no problem. But, uh, yeah, look, I think it could have been... The, it, it's either the milk or the cultures, so you would have to uh, do a bit of a test. You could make a batch with store-bought milk, using those cultures and if it all turned out all right well that's probably half the reason the dairy uh, might have shut down but uh, yeah so it could have been milk quality so yeah like you said you probably made your own diagnosis murray uh, milk or cultures and you would have to test you would have to test the cultures on maybe a smaller batch of cheese and see what happens so hopefully that helps out and uh, apologies for taking so long to getting to you murray well that's about all we've got time for this week You can find all of the cheese making recipes in my ebook Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home, which is available in all ebook formats. So you can find that over at littlegreencheese.com. You can also find all of my cheese making videos um, over on the site. Uh, just have a look for the cheese video tab on the menu bar. Don't forget that you can purchase 
a whole bunch of cheese making equipment, supplies and kits over at our online store littlegreenworkshops.com.au just check out the cheese making section there thanks for listening curd nerds and stay tuned for the next exciting episode of little green cheese podcast during this podcast you heard royalty free music by kevin mcleod i played malt shop bop news theme and call to the dairy cows